Hello, everybody. Just to let folks know in the area, we're going to do an event. It's free, open to the public, so please feel free to stay as long as you want and watch the events about money and politics and how it corrupts our policies. So thanks, everyone, for coming. My name is Jasmine Gomez. I go by, I use she, her, her as pronouns. I'm an attorney and democracy honors fellow for an organization called Free Speech for People. Free Speech for People is a nonpartisan nonprofit that works to get big money out of politics, and those corporations claim that they have constitutional rights and also end corruption in politics. I specifically work on passing an amendment to overturn Citizens United, which is what we're going to learn more about today. Hey everybody, my name is Joyce Sanchez. I also use she, her, her pronouns. Um, my, I'm the Citizen Engagement Coordinator for American Promise. So American Promise is a cross-partisan organization dedicated to overturning Citizens United and winning a 28th Amendment. Uh, so through a 50-state uprising, the American Promise strategy is focused on having a dis di di distributed, decentralized support model, building national consensus, and holding elected officials accountable. Hello, I am Michael Conroy. I am an artist. Boston-based artist, and by fortunate circumstance, painted a painting that speaks to the topic that I find so important, and that these um, very strong activist people also, also find important. So I'm very uh, grateful to sit here and have created a piece of art that someone else saw and wanted to do something with. So, yeah. oh, I uh, I live in Dorchester. I can I have. Instagram and websites mconroyart.com and the same on Instagram uh, mconroyart uh, on IG and do showings uh, showing coming up next month a little poetry slam party in Cambridge and just different things around the city that come up uh, so stuff like that so it's good. Hello everybody my name is Jessica Lee Hayes I'm a Citizen Engagement Coordinator so we wanted to host a space to educate people a little bit more in depth about money and politics, corporate rights, Citizens United, and other related cases. We're going to actually be using this art piece behind us to facilitate the conversation. Um, and we're also, it's going to go through a lot of information today. Some of the information might be dense. Feel free to take notes. Um, feel free to like move around in the space and do whatever you need to do. Um, but also know that we're going to be sending emails out to everybody with the lesson plan, um, as well as we have this recorded, and we'll send a recording link for folks to look more into afterwards as well. <clears throat> At the end, we're also going to leave space for our artist talk back, just so that Michael can answer any questions that you all have about the art piece here, um, any questions about him generally and the art that he does, um, etc. So if at any point in this conversation folks have questions, please just like raise your hand and we'll answer them and we'll talk about it through. So we want this to just be like a, a conversation and we want that to be a dialogue between the both of us. So first, <clears throat> just to kind of get started talking a little bit about art, I'm gonna give folks like a bit of a routine, something to think about. Um, let's talk about what people see in this art piece what people think in this art piece and what people wonder. And so we can start with what do people what do people see? So like I see the words Buckley versus Vallejo. Money. You see money? Middle? Yeah. Say the skyscraper of money. I mean it's skyscraper of money? Yeah. Uh, West twenty West twenty fifth street. Is that an intersection? Great. So let's think about what do folks think about this? So I think that the artist thinks that Buckley versus Vallejo has to do with freedom of speech. That's what I think. Do other folks have thoughts? I think it looks like somebody is stepping on a bunch of other people. I think that probably has to do with money. A big foot stepping on a bunch of people. The road, the road kind of looks like it leads to nowhere. Mm. Road to nowhere. The loop of an arrow that comes from the state house back to the state house. The money is flowing. So money, you think money is flowing through? 
the State House? Do other folks have thoughts? What do you think about this piece? What do folks wonder about this piece? I wonder what Buckley versus Vallejo is. I wonder how widespread knowledge this stuff is. How widespread knowledge this is? How many people know about this stuff? I wonder about that uh, uh, intersection. Like that was like, I mean, it looks, I'm from New York, so it looks like somewhere mm -hmm. in New York. Mm -hmm. yes, New York. I wonder what this intersection has to do with and if it's based in New York. Great. So it's actually, you guys are really visual. It's awesome. Um, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to work around the piece of art itself to kind of talk about a lot of the topics that we touched on. So let me start with Buckley versus Vallejo because over here it looks like the start and it is the start. So Buckley versus Vallejo is actually a case that came out in 1776 and it was after Watergate. So there's bipartisan campaign finance um, laws that were passed uh, and Congress really wanted these spending limits for a couple reasons. One is to avoid corruption. There has been a lot of corruption politics, especially right after Nixon, Watergate and everything happened. Um, but was, another was to promote political equality. So this idea that everybody has an equal say in politics. Um, wealthy donors did not like campaign finance limits, so they sued and they said that their First Amendment rights were being violated. Before we go into the holding a little bit, I want to check in to see if folks know some of the terms that we're going to be talking about, just because there's a lot of terms um, and you know, I, I want everyone to be on an equal kind of field. Um, does anybody in the audience know what an expenditure is? Sounds like spending money. Sounds like spending money, yep. So it's actually a political campaign communication, so it's like spending money for an ad or spending money for a documentary um, that expressly advocates for the election or the defeat of a certain candidate. So do folks know what an independent expenditure would be then? So an independent expenditure is advocating for a politician without materially working in coordination with that politician. So it's basically spending that is made independent of coordination with the politician. These restrictions that determine whether something is independent or dependent are actually um, really easy to exploit. There's a lot of loopholes within that. Um, so for example, there's a senator, Senator Tom Tills, who's running for election, and he posted on his website a memo, and the memo outlines everything in detail about what his campaign wants their advertising strategy to be. And so he's not, because he posted it online and it's in a public forum, he didn't expressly and directly communicate to people who would donate to his campaign, therefore it's independent. Well, really, it's not independent at all. Um, do people know what a contribution is? So that one's a little more direct. That one's the direct giving money to a politician. So a contribution is spending money on behalf of a politician, but a contribution is giving money directly to a politician. And those are treated differently under the law. Do folks know what a PAC is? Political Action Committee. So a Political Action Committee is made for advocating for a politician through these expenditures. So through the spending, not directly contributing, but through spending for a politician or against a politician. And a super PAC is the same, a political action committee, but the expenditures that they make are always independent expenditures. So they're technically never in coordination with a politician. So that was just like a little bit of background, just so like folks kind of um, get some of the language that we're gonna be using, but the decision actually said for Buckley versus Vallejo that limitations on independent expenditures, limitations on expenditures by candidates for their own personal um, family or resources for themselves, for their own campaign, and the total limits of campaign expenditures all have constitutional protections as free speech. 
And so this is kind of where this overlay in money goes. And so the spending of money, the spending of political expenditures, now is protected under the Constitution because of this court case as free speech. And the only way that we could prevent that spending, the only way we can limit it, is to prevent corruption or the appearance of corruption. So I kind of want to just run through that one more time, put over here and write it out. So the first thing that the court case decided is that money equals speech expenditures. Another thing that it determined is there's a difference between expenditures and contributions. Third thing that is said is that we could only limit money in politics if there was corruption or the appearance of corruption. And finally, rich people can spend unlimited amounts of money on their own campaigns. Okay, so for many reasons, all of them are purely political, not actually legal. This wasn't really highly exploited when Buckley versus Vallejo came out. But as we see, it later became exploited. We're gonna follow this around, and we're gonna take it over here to Citizens United. So this is another court case, and this is a big time court case. Um, I think a lot of folks probably, has anybody here heard of the court case Citizens United? So I think a lot of folks maybe have heard of it, and if not, that's totally cool. This is what this is about. Citizens United um, built a lot off of Buckley versus Vallejo. And so first, the facts of it. There was a bipartisan campaign reform act, and it prevented corporations from using their general treasury funds to run advertisements to support a campaign. So we just prevented corporations from using their own money to support or advocate against a candidate. Citizens United was a nonprofit, still a corporation, and they sued because they wanted to run a documentary giving reasons to not vote for Hillary Clinton. So the holding of Citizens United, it built off of Buckley and it, and it said a, a few core things. So one of the things that said that corporations have that same First Amendment right is people. And you can see that here, right? Corporations are now considered people. Um, in addition, the only type of corruption that we're able to regulate is no longer corruption or the appearance of corruption, but quid pro quo corruption. What that is is literally handing money for a vote. So it's bribery, so literally bribery. So it narrowed dramatically. It said that the only way that we could regulate campaign spending is through corruption. We don't care about political equality. We don't care about promoting equality for other people. We just care about preventing corruption. But before, at least that, that definition of corruption was much broader. And after Citizens United, it got narrowed to basically something that's impossible to prove. Um, so it's really, really hard to prove that. So the court reiterated that we have no ability to regulate to promote political equality. And you know, bribery, while it is a problem, it pales in comparison to the problems of inequality in our country, um, be it economic inequality, racial inequality, political inequality, and other forms of inequality and oppression. So this court case actually ended up overturning a lot of different cases. So there were cases before it that held different opinions, and the Supreme Court just went away with all of that. Um, so just kind of building again off of this over here. So it took this notion that money is speech, and it said, for corporations too. It said, it's not just, it's not corruption or the appearance of corruption that we can regulate, but just bribery. And they went on to also say that independent expenditures, which is what we talked about earlier, that are not actually that independent, independent expenditures could never, ever, ever in the whole world be corrupt. 
So therefore, we could never regulate any independent expenditures because it's not going to be corrupt because they're independent. So it basically took on a lot of what Citizens United said and took it even further. I mean, sorry, a lot of what Buckley versus Vallejo said and took it further. And it was because of this case, Citizens United up here, and this was in 2010, um, that super PACs came to be. Super PACs were created. Businesses, corporations, companies started saying, oh, okay, well, if independent expenditures could never be corrupt and you could never regulate them, then we should be able to spend unlimited amounts of money in those expenditures and that will fund politicians. Um, and that was a DC circuit case. And so, so I want to talk a little bit, how did, how did this come to be? Because corporations didn't just start claiming corporate constitutional rights in 2010. Like this wasn't a brand new thing at this point. It wasn't like complete shocker that came out of nowhere. There is a history of it. So is after the 14th Amendment came out, corporations started trying to use the 14th Amendment to overturn laws that would develop, or to overturn laws like workers' comp, child labor, and conservation laws. So it was in 1886, there was a court case um, called Santa Clara County, and the Supreme Court agreed with corporations on the 14th Amendment, but because of some California law, something not really related to the crux of the 14th Amendment, corporations should be able to have that. Um, nothing really happened with that court case until, this is like the 1800s, this is maybe 1886. Nothing really happened until the 1920s. In the 1920s, we saw the Gilded Age. So this is when the Supreme Court justice was really pro-business. They wanted to do everything that they could to support businesses. They advocated strongly um, for businesses a lot. And they used the Santa Clara County case during the 20s all the way up until 1937 to develop these corporate constitutional right theories. Um, after 37, there was a switch in time that saved nine. So Roosevelt was basically done with uh, the courts being so pro-business. Pro so he said, we're going to add four more justices, I'm gonna appoint them all, um, it's gonna change the entire makeup of the court. And so at that point, the Supreme Court stopped being judicial activists and it kind of lulled until 1970. And so this is the current event, the 1970 time, and I think that this is where corporate constitutional rights really, really, really developed. Um, so it's at this time that Lewis Powell wrote a memo to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I'm gonna check in here. Do folks know what the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is? Does anybody here know? Does anybody wanna take a guess? <laughs> so, so it's actually a business-oriented lobbying group. It's not a government agency. I know it sounds tricky and that's on purpose, I'm sure. Um, the Chamber is actually the largest lobbying group in the United States, and they spend more money than any other lobbying group yearly for a long time. And it was actually created by President Taft as a counterbalance to the labor movement. So the labor movement was being very successful, and they felt like businesses were being attacked. So they came up with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So what happened in the 1970s? In 1971, Lewis Powell, who at that time was a lawyer for tobacco companies, and he later became a Supreme Court Justice. He wrote to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and he said that the strides made for democracy were going to harm corporations, and the corporations needed to fight back, and the best place to fight back was in the courts. So as a result, corporations started ramping up lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit, bringing it forward, um, claiming that corporate entities had the same constitutional rights as people. But if corporations won those arguments, then the result is that any kind of government regulation on the corporation would be invalidated. Um, so once, once Powell got to the Supreme Court, unsurprising, he decided many court cases in favor of corporate rights. Um, and since that memo, the chamber has been increasingly successful in litigation. And so when that memo first came out in the 70s, um, between the 70s and through the 90s, their court cases about 50, 43 to 56% of the court cases won. But as of the last time around that we checked, June 21st, 2012, 
they won 68% of the court cases that they brought forward to the Supreme Court. So almost 70% of the Supreme Court cases that they're bringing forward, they're winning. And, and a lot of these have to do with expanding corporate rights um, to folks. Which actually leads us to Hobby Lobby. So Hobby Lobby's not on this painting, um, but I think it's just really important too, so I just want to bring it in. So Hobby Lobby Corporation said, not only do we have the First Amendment right to speech that Buckley and Citizens United gave us, but we also have a First Amendment right to religious freedom. And so they use that as a way to invalidate government regulations that corporations argued validated their own religious freedom. So I think I'm going to switch it over to Joyce, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this building of money, right? Um, and this foot and stopping on the people and the cyclical money going into Congress. What does it mean? So what does this system mean for the policies that they're, that the system is now promoting? And how does that hurt people of color? How does that hurt queer trans folks? How does that hurt everyday people? All right, thank you so much, Jasmine, for all that great information. Um, all right, so the question is, how does a big money system harm pe poor people and people of color? So a lot of people can guess right now that there is a political donor class and then there's the rest of us. We're in a moment in which money and political power is incredibly concentrated. A donor class comprised of affluent people and corporations can spend unlimited, amount, uh, uh, unlimited amounts of money on elections. And they have very different views and demands than the rest of us. Members of this elite donor class have greater access to their elected officials because elected officials are often already calling them for fundraising. The policies that our representatives enact, naturally, knowing that, are skewed toward the same wealthy donor class. In other words, the wealthy have better representation than the rest of us. Research, research shows that when it comes to economic policies, when the views of the wealthiest 10% conflict with those of the bottom 90%, the 10% trumps the 90%. So with that being said, money in politics is about more than any one issue. It's really about how our government makes decisions on all the issues we face and who is represented in our democracy. So the problem is about political inequality, but it's also closely linked to economic and racial inequalities as well. So the money in po uh, politics especially harms people of color and other marginalized communities. When you have a political system built off an economic system in the, U in the U.S. that is particularly harmful for black people, people of color, and other marginalized people who have been systematically excluded from economic opportunity. The U.S. economic system is built off slavery and racism, which is prevalent, prevalent in those systems today. Money and politics works in, conjunct in, con in conjunction with past and present systematic r racism, discrimination, and injustice. Systems of oppression are tied to money and politics, and those feeling the most harm from money and politics are those who are already facing discrimination, oppression, or domination in other areas. Money and politics functionally make systems of oppression even more oppressive. To kind of build off of that a little bit and kind of go into it a little bit more, in 2014, Demos, Demos is a, another nonprofit, nonpartisan, they're a think tank organization that works primarily on studying the issues of money and politics. Demos, they did a study called Stack Deck, and it links big money and politics to like racial inequality. Demos has also done extensive research on the racial wealth gap and the asset value of whiteness. And so from these studies, we know that because of our country's history and present practices of excluding people of color from our economy and our democracy, there's gaps of over $100,000 in the median household wealth controlled by white families versus families of color. In the queer and trans community, in addition to racial inequality, we also see gaps of wealth controlled by cis and straight people as opposed to queer and trans people. And that's linked to the fact that across the country, not all legislators and courts are actively working to protect queer and trans people from discrimination. In addition to the violence and hostility that many trans and gender non-conforming people face, especially black trans women and trans women of color, trans and gender non-conforming people are almost four times more likely to live in extreme poverty, and black trans women are almost 8.5 times more likely to live in extreme poverty. Trans people of color are represented in the donor class itself and every single layer of government. So it's unsurprising that candidates of color, they have a hard time running in the first place, and when they do run, they raise less money, um, especially in the South. 
Our country is basically created what we consider a wealth primary. So in order to even run for elections, you have to have wealth. What that means is that people with marginalized identities are underrepresented in the halls of power, and they often face huge gaps in the control of wealth, including on the basis of racist and gender identity. So when you combine all of that oppression and all of that history of oppression with four decades of Supreme Court decisions that empower political donors to spend unlimited amounts of money in politics, then you get a system that's dominated by really wealthy, white, male, um, straight, cis, donors and the government is skewed in favor of that specific donor class and against the priorities and needs of people of color and queer and trans people of color. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the policy implications of this. So I have a little graph here. here that pretty much is going to show the percentage of the wealthy versus the general public that favor, um, you know, when it comes to their job and income policy purposes. Um, so this is like a little guessing game. So um, how much of the wealthy do people think are in favor of the government making sure that no one is without food, clothing, or shelter? Take a wild guess. How much? Zero. Zero. Point we we got zero. Point one. <laughs> Rounds down to zero, yeah. Okay, rounds down to zero. Great stuff. All right, so actually, 43% of the wealthy are in favor of making sure that no one is without food, clothing, and shelter in comparison to the 68% of the general public uh, wanting this. All right, next step. So how how much, um, of, well, how many of the wealthy do you believe um, are in favor of minimum wage being high enough so no family with a full-time worker falls below the official poverty line. I have to ask one question. How are you defining wealthy? What's the criteria for wealthy? If you want to know more about it, this comes from the DEMO study. And so we can send around an email to everybody with the DEMO study specifically, as well as like the lesson plan for the event and any of the other um, Okay. Alright, so does anyone want to take a wild guess about how, how many of the wealthy favor this statement? 20%? 20%. Any more guesses? 21%. 21. We've got 20. Oh, 21. Alright, so 40% are in favor, well, 40% of the wealthy are in favor of this uh, versus the 78% of the general public. Next up, um, the government should provide a decent standard of living for the unemployed. What do you think the percentage is of the wealthy? 20. 20? You said 20? 10. 10? Okay, 10. 40? Okay, okay. 15? All right, so it's actually 23% of the wealthy are in favor of this, while 50% of the public are in favor of this. And last but not least, the government in Washington ought to see it that everyone who wants to work can find a job. How much? 80% of the wealthy? Okay. Okay, okay. So that's actually 19% of the wealthy are in favor of this while 68% of the general public are in favor of this. So those are the little differences between the wealthy and the general public. Um, all right, so stemming off of that, Free Speech for People created an American Promise sponsored a, a well, co-sponsored a money and politics event centering the queer and trans community. We had grassroots activists who work with the queer and trans community in Boston come and provide compelling examples of how the concentration of wealth and political power has hurt ad, ad, advocacy, I can't say that word today, for queer and trans liberation, both from the thousand foot level and the day to day. 
So the founding director of the national organization Black and Pink, Reverend Jason Lydon, Lydon? Cool. Uh, pointed out in our cr criminal law system, private prisons and related business businesses that profit from continued over-criminalization have an interest in judges who are tough on crime. In states where judges are elected, these groups will lobby for these judges who support pro-incarceration policies because it benefits the private prisons and the prison guard unions. So do you want to kind of simplify that a little bit, Jasmine? Yeah, so basically private prisons and prison guard unions, they profit off of over-incarceration. So they profit off of putting the most people that they can in jail. So they support judges, prosecutors, other elected officials who also support putting as many people in jail as possible. Um, so that, that's a clear, like, how that interest conflicts with the interest of the general public. Yep, so in Massachusetts, a prison guard union is Governor Charlie Baker's top contributor. Um, after Charlie Baker himself and the Republican Party and their unequal wealth and influence help enact policies that dehumanize incarcerated uh, queer and trans people and people of color. Executive Director of the Massachusetts Trans Transgender Political Coalition, Mason Dunn, also talked about how money in politics has affected his advocacy over the years, including how organizers fighting for the queer and trans community, um, well, excuse me, queer and trans equality and racial justice are disadvantaged in their ability to buy media access. As a result, the companies and private wealth controlling the mainstream media have an upper hand in controlling the public narrative often in ways that dehumanize the queer and trans community. I also, with Free Speech for People, wrote a report on how money in politics affects immigration policy. Um, so this report really highlighted that this isn't just a problem that affects Republicans, but rather it's a problem that affects Republicans, Democrats, everyone. So in California, there was a private prison company that donated $25,000 to Governor Jerry Brown in 2010 and 50,000 in 2014. A different private prison company donated 60K to Governor Brown's campaign in 2012. So Governor Brown was then also was, um, his reelection campaign received two million from California's prison guard unions. So unsurprisingly, subsequent to Governor Brown getting all of that money, he vetoed legislation that was overwhelmingly passed by the Senate and the House in California that would have prevented the use of private prisons as immigration detention centers. Um, the, the, the community really rallied behind that because these private prison companies and these detention centers are oftentimes known for their inhumane conditions, including poor or no access to health care and education. Um, the guards at private prisons have also been known to sexually abuse transgender immigrant women, as well as cis women and other queer people. So, um, so learning all of this and about the the court cases, and looking at this beautiful painting behind us, um, can anyone take a wild guess why a constitutional amendment is the best solution to fix this problem? I guess. Citizens United affect the Constitution and amendment. Yeah, Citizens United effectively overturned Congress's bipartisan campaign limits. So the only way that a Supreme, if a Supreme Court overturns legislation, the only way that the Supreme Court can be overturned, you're right, is through another constitutional amendment or the Supreme Court changing its own mind. Yeah, so there's uh, a couple reasons why a constitutional amendment is the best solution. Uh, number one, um, depending on what Jasmine just explained, Congress can't fix our democracy. So the Supreme Court overturned the uh, Congress's bipartisan campaign finance rules. So the best way to change the Supreme Court decision is through the constitutional amendment. Number two, the Supreme Court won't fix our democracy anytime soon. The president recently appointed Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court based on his previous court decisions. Gorsuch seems to support money and politics and may make it more difficult to enact protections for everyday people. Number three, Supreme Court decisions are not permanent. Even if the Supreme Court does overturn Citizens United, who is to say things wouldn't change again when the court makeup changes? Amendments, on the other hand, are permanent. So, and last but not least, a grassroots, centered, a citizen-centered approach is best. So everyday people know 
best uh, what their community needs and what should be included in an amendment to get big money out of politics and to promote equality. With all that being said, passing an amendment is definitely hard and a, and a journey, but it's definitely possible. So over the last century, citizens in the U.S. have passed 10 constitutional amendments, about one per decade, and honestly it's time for a new amendment. Um, so this isn't new. We have always had to fight to expand our democracy, but history shows that when everyday people engage, amendments expanding democracy pass. So examples of this include the 19th Amendment, um, so what, that's when women fought for decades to get basic rights, including the right to vote. Uh, the 24th Amendment, um, when the Supreme Court decided to allow poll taxes to continue despite evidence that they had prevented people of color from voting, civil rights activists successfully pushed for an amendment that overturned the Supreme Court decision. And last but not least, the 26th Amendment, uh, which is anniversary actually just passed, uh, but it was the bipartisan youth, you know, it's when that bipartisan youth advocated heavily for lowering the voting age to 18 years, which is why I was able to vote when I went to school. Um, which is amazing. So, um, you know, definitely, we can definitely do this. So, um, as of now, um, over, well, 19 states and over 700 communities, honestly close to 800, have already called for a 20th Amendment and overturning Citizens United. Um, so, and really just more, jo more states to join with every election. So, this is a bipartisan effort with popular support, anywhere um, between 75 to 84 percent of people agree that money has too much of an, of an influence in politics. So we are not in this alone. So before we go into what we can do in Massachusetts and how to get involved, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Yeah, so there's a couple process. The process that's been used throughout history has been that two thirds of the state legislature, or sorry, of the states, the Congress, Congress, both House and um, Senate, uh, have to pass an amendment, and then three fourths of the states have to then ratify an amendment. So it's it's a little bit of a journey. We've already gotten a lot of support in the Congress, in a Congress, um, surprisingly, uh, on an overturning Citizens United corporate rights, we're still working on it, um, but the way that you continue to get Congress and congressional officials to want to go ahead and enact an amendment to overturn Citizens United is through grassroots activism. Um, so that's why people on the ground in all, you know, all the states um, that American Promise is working in really are fighting on the ground to get ballot initiatives to overturn Citizens United through resolutions compelling their legislators. Is that a state Congress or uh, national U.S.? Yeah, federal Congress and then the state um, legislators have to be the ones who then enact it, ratify it. Does anybody else have any questions? Or real questions? So I'll quickly go on to what you can do in Massachusetts uh, to get more involved. So even though Massachusetts has already passed le legislation, uh, to overturn Citizens United, um, the really the legislators really haven't really done anything about it, and honestly, they're not champions for it. Um, so to put some people power behind it, American Promise will officially launch the People Not Money campaign in September. Um, and with the People Not Money campaign ballot initiative, uh, we the people of Massachusetts will speak loud and clear to say enough is enough. Uh, the campaign will make sure that the people of Massachusetts vote yes for the 20th Amendment so that people, not money, decide our elections and futures. Um, the people instruct our politicians once and for all to work together, regardless of partisan divides, to get the 28th Amendment to limit the undue influence of big money in elections and the takeover of our constitutional rights by corporations out of Congress and back to the people of Massachusetts for ratification. And last but not least, this campaign um, will create our nonpartisan citizen commission to make sure these instructions are followed to get factual information to the people and hold the politi uh, politicians' feet to the fire. It's pretty much our watchdog in the process. Um, so definitely, if you want to get more involved and have any more questions about the details of it, we have a wonderful volunteer. Um, he goes by the name of Larry Scarf. He's actually leading the whole campaign. Um, he's absolutely amazing. So if you want to be a you know a signature gatherer or a district captain or anything like that, or just want to kind of jump in on one of the volunteer calls that we have, to learn more about it, please um, come talk to me after. I have a little sign-in sheet. Um, I can I can just take down your name and information, and we can move forward with it. So thanks.
And just, and just to clarify, that's a ballot initiative. So basically we need people on the ground to get enough signatures so that we can get that ballot to vote for it. So that's what we're kind of gathering people and the people power to do, to be on the ground, gathering signatures and being willing to support this. So before further ado, before we leave, we're gonna have Michael come up here. Um, please talk about anything you want, anything you learned from this event, anything about your art piece, maybe give a little context of why you decided to create this art piece, and if anybody has any questions for him. Are those actual dollar bills? Yes. Well, I'm twenty dollars in the hole. So I gotta sell it for at least twenty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it's actual money. Uh, the so yeah, that I guess on that topic, why I chose money, I suppose, is because it, uh, obviously it was a, kind of a nerdy adventure into creating a piece of art. It was more like I was watching documentaries and research and all this stuff. Uh, Definitely, it was led in, not so much political, it was really led in on what everyone spoke about, about like uh, how people are affected in daily life and experience, and I was in construction experience, oh wait, layoffs experience, losing a home, all its value, and it was like, how did that happen? Uh, and that's how it happened, basically. But, um, so it was really from a humanitarian thing, and then I stumbled across all this information. Uh, and was like, uh, Wow, uh, basically it's a lot of information. So, uh, but the money was the uh, because I, I honestly I figured if I put real money on it, someone would ask what the painting was about, and that would probably start a conversation. Because uh, someone would be like, "Why is that money? Like, why why do you put money on that?" Uh, and then I guess the, you you had asked you said something about the street signs. Um, that was the last kind of component I put in it um, and it was this in New York City like you said there is there's a school there it's called the avenues it's for you know it's an exceptionally affluent school that's in New York City and across the street from it is uh, a housing project and uh, it just spoke to me as like you know just a it, the, the whole thing's kind of addressing the haves and the have-nots and how did we get so separate and why is there inequality and why is the economy play such a role in Society. Uh, I grew up thinking they were different. And I found out they're not so dissimilar. Um, but that school was like a. I mean, you can't really have a have and have nots picture in society more than kids, 13 year old kids going to school for $50,000 a year and people living in poverty literally across the street. Uh, I found it interesting that the school had promised. Uh, as part of the outreach of into a community that they were going to have kids from the community be able to go to the school and up until whatever four years run not one kid from any neighborhood had been allowed in it, uh, got into that school uh -huh. um, the that the, that is like the, the that is this opulence is why it's stepping on people is like that to me was the, why it says middle on the foot it was because that was the middle class and uh, after everything being after everything being explained, uh, it was pretty obvious that corporate America and and really corporate financing. I mean, politics, you know, uh, campaign financing plays a pretty significant role in uh, people, regular people, having a difficult chance of gaining an advantage. Uh, the like she said, I think it's pretty. It's pretty amazing that uh, a monetary value could be considered freedom of speech. I don't, in my logical mind, can't understand why money can be considered. I mean, communication and money, money, a, a physical thing, can be considered speech. I just can't really grasp why that could ever have a problem. And I don't, and on the topic of corruption, I don't see how, if money can have that right, how corruption isn't every time attached to it. Uh, I mean, you can't stop human beings from being human. And uh, when you give humans the ability to corrupt, we will. It's just the creatures we are. So, um, the any questions? Like, it's very uncomfortable. I must admit, talking about a piece of art that I painted. <laughs> uh, I guess how much did? Uh, how much do you think that? I guess. Uh, capitalism has a role to play in the 
structure of this. So did you like think about that? Like the of this? Yes. Uh, yeah, specifically, I thought of uh, I I thought of it from like all right. Well, I grew up in a you know uh, middle what well, what I don't know in the 90, in 1980 I was probably middle class. Now my tax bracket is probably poor, but the uh, but the, like when, the way I grew up, the way I just looked at it was like, well, how come? Why why is it that uh, pe people can get ahead and other people can't? Why? And everyone says like, oh, if you have, if you have money, you can get ahead. And I was just like, is that actually true or not? Uh, I don't think it's an I don't think it's a indictment on someone's character, but I do think that after seeing how the corporations work and how money can allow people to get ahead, it's uh, just present more opportunities. It's it's not a mystery to me of how the, the class divide stays intact. Like how it is difficult to get onto the other side of that tax bracket, and just from. I mean, school alone. Like, you come out if you have money before you went to school, you come out with less student loans. You can, you can take more risk with less bills. Uh, and it's that's so corporate was everything to do. I think of answer that question. It was uh, these laws that were spoken about, like, created to me a direct line to how a regular person like us actually are affected by these things. Uh, and. It, there's a disadvantage. That's just, it's not a, that's not a complaint, it's just a fact, which is okay, but it's a fact. So, that's kind of where I was going with it, I'm thinking. Who's this person? Um, it was a loose reference to Greenspan, um, the, the, uh, he was head of the Federal, Federal Reserve Bank, and I found it interesting that, um, he, he was quoted as saying in a, in a okay, in front of Congress, saying that the best way to secure, um, to basically subdue the, the masses, the population, to keep everything in line, is to economic fear. And the greatest way to control uprisings, that essentially are what you guys, what we're all trying to flirt with, I guess, is that if you have economic fear, if you're worried to lose, your, if you're afraid that you might lose your job, you are less likely to advocate for yourself. Um, I experienced that personally when, um, I, in 08, when I was, I, was in, I was a construction worker and it became, if you had a job, it, you don't complain. You just, it's, you're lucky to have a job and the reality is, employment is a two-way street. Someone is, you are providing a service and they are compensating you for that service. They are not donating money to you. Uh, so that was where, that, that line, I have personally felt economic fear make me not want to pursue larger things, which is a, it's a false. It's not. Why are two dollar bills red? Because I view the whole thing as blood money, essentially. Well, you have X's on uh, a few of them as well. What, uh, what are those for? Frustration, like as I was. Uh, I guess I paint kind of emotionally, so when I'm painting and I'm thinking about this stuff, and I'm getting, I get, I get, it, I get kind of angry at money as the entity that it is at times. Uh, so it was more X in the mode kind of thing. That's why I chose red. A lot of the color is red. Why was? That's why it was frustration kind of show because it, it it comes down to blood. It's kind of like blood money. It feels that way to me. Uh, it keeps people down, and that's that's not cool with me. Uh, the the arm was written specifically for like adjustable rate mortgages, um, things like that. I was just trying to trying to just play with all the ideas. The the hand, the you know the John Hancock Building. That's the Hancock Building in the city of Boston, which is a insurance company, which is. Uh, they're pretty powerful. Uh, the United States of America insur insurance companies have strong pull. I, I believe there's no more, correct me, I'm not the smart one. Uh, I believe there's insurance companies lead the way in like total corporate, I mean campaign financing. I believe they're up there. Right, they're up there. So that was to me was uh, why that body came about and how much influence 
Uh, so it's not it's not John Hancock specifically stepping on the middle class, but it's the fundamental of campaign financing. Uh, that's too big to fail. All that stuff, deregulation, like in how you how you break down these laws and legislation, defund them, make you know social legislation collapse. It looks bad. You defund it, uh, and you want something new. And that's how you get rid of policy. And that's and the bailouts and banks. It's a lot to think about. <laughs> Anything? Yes, you can relieve me of course. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Give a round of applause for Michael and everyone today. Thank you all for joining. We have some uh, information in the back on this little table over here. So if folks want to grab, we have information about American Promise, information about free speech for people. I also have a one-pager that talks a little bit about how money politics and corporate rights affects the queer and trans community. Um, so that's back there too. And we have some information about the Citizens Uprising Initiative as well. And if folks haven't, if you want to sign the sign-in sheet, we can send you all the information that we have today, as well as any of these um, documents and such too. So thank you all for joining. Have a great day.